Our presenter is Susan Armstrong. Um, she's known to many of you. She's a registered clinical counselor who provides counseling and clinical supervision alongside her therapy dog, Grace, in her private practice in Vernon, BC. She's over 30 years of experience working as a therapist, a clinical supervisor, a researcher, and a community educator in the field of trauma. For 10 years, she worked exclusively in indigenous community, and she commenced a therapy program for indigenous children and youth in permanent care. Susan has been a program manager for a large rural nonprofit and an executive director for an urban mental health agency. Supporting women on the front line of anti-violence work is one of Susan's passions. And I'm very pleased to turn this over to Susan now. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you for all of you who have been able to gather with us live and welcome to those who are viewing us from the comfort of their office or home at a later time. Uh, just some reminders that this webinar is being recorded for those who want to review or view um, at another time. It'll eventually be posted on the EVA BC website. Um, because of that, um, all the participants are muted and are um, off camera, so just to protect some privacy. But your participation is so welcome throughout our time together. Anytime you have a comment or a question, please use the chat to um, participate and to inform us and enrich us. Uh, the chat will not be recorded, so your privacy is, is protected. If you are having any technical difficulties and I uh, can relate, um, please uh, type th that in the chat box and someone much more knowledgeable than me will help you out. And just to let you know at the very end of our time together, there is gonna be an evaluation link. And given that this is the beginning of uh, one of three webinars. We really appreciate your um, input. If you can uh, take just a few moments at the end of our time. Um, thank you. And Laura, I'm just going to give you the opportunity to do the land acknowledgement from where you are and, uh, and then I will follow you. I'm here in the EVA BC office and we respectfully acknowledge that these offices are located on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Salatooth nations. And we are thankful to be able to work and play on their lands. And I'm so honored that I'm coming to you today from the ancestral and unceded and traditional territory of the Shumapik and Silk peoples. And I've recently um, been taught by uh, Tatatya Michelle Nahani, who is from Squamish territory, that when we do this, we are invoking the good medicine of the land that we are on, that the prayers and the ceremonies through the generations stay with the land. And so I so appreciated that teaching. And I would ask those who are with us live right now, if you want to introduce yourself to um, each other in the chat and, and also to include the acknowledgement of the land that you are in, knowing that you are gathering the good medicine of your land to yourself. And for those who are watching us at another time, just to take a moment to acknowledge the land that you're on, also bringing that good medicine to yourself. Yes, I have been doing trauma work for 31 years. <laughs> And um, I do want to share with you that um, certainly in those 31 years, I have lived through the impacts of vicarious trauma and secondary traumatic stress. They have been realities for me. And also that um, there's been a tremendous amount of growth for me through this work, which is often called um, vicarious growth or vicarious traumatic growth. And that I often say to folks that I bring my best self to my work and that my best self has grown and deepened through the work that I am in more connection to realities that are larger than myself, that I have an increased emotional uh, bravery, that this work has deepened my compassion for myself and for others. It has increased my ability to be present to myself and others. And so 
I, I just want to start with that because I know that uh, uh, many of you will be younger than me <laughs> and, and I'm sure that there's a few of you out there who are older than me and that I think that it's helpful through the time of doing this work to not only reflect on some of the challenging impacts but also the enriching impacts of being privileged to hold this role. What we're covering in our hour and a half together is um, I'm, I'm going to define terms with you. Um, there's a lots of different terms that are out there about how this work arrives in ourselves. We're going to look at what the research tells us about how prevalent this is. We're going to look at risk factors. What makes me more vulnerable or perhaps more resilient to um, vicarious trauma? We're going to discuss some impacts. And then we're going to look a little bit more deeply into what I just mentioned about my, for my own reality of the very positive ways that this work can change us. I want to let you know, so that's what we're doing this afternoon. And um, I've already mentioned that this is one of a three part series and you're welcome to participate in any or all and in your own time or, um, or live. And so tomorrow there'll be another live webinar and its focus is going to be on assessment of how am I doing and the various assessment tools and strategies of tools to um, mitigate the impact of vicarious trauma. So that's the second webinar. And the third webinar is organizational strategies. What can our agencies um, have in place to help support us in our work? So those are the three webinars. So key concepts. Um, the term that Eva BC is um, using most of the time is vicarious trauma. It is often the more umbrella term of how these impacts show up. And uh, it was a term that was first um, coined by uh, feminist uh, researchers. And so we certainly appreciate those roots. Um, and so vicarious trauma is defined as the cumulative impacts of exposure to and engagement with other suffering, that our hearts, our spirits are engaged in this work. Then we have the other term, secondary traumatic stress. And this is a specific um, impact that it is literally experiencing intrusive traumatic symptoms related to the client's trauma. So I mentioned to you in my introduction, I've experienced that as well. And it li literally was having flashbacks of a client's traumatic detail. Um, it can also show up in, in dreams. Compassion fatigue, again, is cumulative. The way that it shows up is an erosion of a sense of connection and compassion to ourselves and to those that we serve. Um, compassion fatigue is not uh, specific to trauma work. It's as relevant to health professionals, caregivers teachers. And then burnout, physical and emotional exhaustion as a result of prolonged stress and frustration. Sometimes, very often, we are working in contexts that are under-resourced, that we are working in collaboration with systems that we are unable to influence. And it's uh, those realities that sometimes can result in a sense of burnout. And just to say that one can experience multiple of these impacts at the same time. So although they each one has a different presentation, and when they were first um, identified, they um, were seen as separate and distinct impacts. Several decades later, as research and theorizing has, has continued, these terms have really become interchangeable. And so um, you'll sometimes find that people are using secondary traumatic stress as sort of an umbrella term. So it can get confusing. Throughout um, our time together, um, the umbrella term for us is vicarious trauma with an acknowledgement that there are these other impacts that have uh, their sp specific imprint. I'm 
Normalizing impacts. Um, I love this quote. Uh, it's just so meaningful to me. And um, as a clinical supervisor, I often remind people of this. The expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not be touched by it is as unrealistic as expecting to be able to walk through water without getting wet. And I ask you just take a moment to sit with the reality of those words because over and over I hear folks who are really experiencing some impacts and they are thinking that they're doing something wrong. You are not doing anything wrong by being changed and transformed by this work. It is not an absence of your self-care. It is here because you are present in your work, because you are heart-centered in your work, and because you are exposed to deep suffering and sometimes exposed to the reality of inequalities in our society. So please take that in. Can we do many things to support us ourselves in those impacts? Absolutely. But if anyone says to me, oh, no, I've not been impacted by this work, that comment scares me. <laughs> and I immediately think, where are you then? You're, you're, you've either had to shut down so completely <laughs> to not be impacted, which is indeed an impact, <laughs> or I would begin to wonder about where's your heart in the work? Impacts of chronic stress. Our dear friend, uh, Dr. Gabor Mate says, our immune system does not exist in isolation from daily experience. Of course, our stressors <laughs> come into our body and affect our physical health. Sorry, I wanted to say a little bit more about that. Um, and for all of us, stress loads ebb and flow. Um, and sometimes that's about our personal social location. If I am income insecure, my stress will be higher. If I'm a first or second generation impact, I will have a different stress load than someone who has has a family history of being here for multiple generations. If I carry multiple caregiving roles, that has its own stress. And then we have the impact of community events. So we have our baselines of stress. And then we have what's happening in our community. Has a major employer closed, impacting our um, the health and well-being and security of our overall community? Has there been a tragic event in your community? These are the ebbs and flows that we bring into our work. And then, of course, as we're all so aware in this year, we have our global events, a pandemic, um, an increased awareness of white supremacy, particularly for those who do carry white skin, because certainly those who do not have had an awareness of white supremacy from day one. Um, all of these inform, mold our chronic stress. And just speaking for a moment about the impacts of the pandemic, in a pandemic, the cracks in our system get wider. We have years of research that shows that when a society is going through a natural disaster or a disaster of some sort, it is the most vulnerable, the people who are most on the edges, the people who are most marginalized, who have the greatest impacts. And in fact, those people will recover less when safety has been restored. For us, in experiencing wider and wider cracks, our isolation has increased. There has been increased need for our services. And for many of us, we have had an increase in the multiple roles that we carry. For those of you who have responsibility to young ones and responsibility to elders, I'm sure you have felt that even more so in the time of the pandemic. So a question that I have for you, and um, we're going to have an opportunity for everyone to respond to this question, and it will be anonymous, um, is 
what overall impact has a pandemic had on your personal and professional wellness? So that is um, our question for you. And you can see that it's now up and you can enter in your answer. And, um, and no one can see who's answering how. And once everyone has answered, we'll come back to the results. Thank you for that. So I'm just going to, uh, while people are answering away, I'm going to just talk a little bit more about, because I've just done a pretty quick summary of stress that I think a whole lot of us out there are going, yeah, that's me, that's me, that's my reality. And these are some of the ways that um, it shows up in our, um, in our bodies. Raised blood pressure, weight gain or weight loss, People have been talking about the COVID weight gain in particular, insomnia, uh, constipation or diarrhea, grinding teeth, hypertension, chest pains, ulcers, frequent urination, headaches, nervous tics, skin rashes, um, impotence or menstrual disorders, rapid tiredness, anxiety. That's not an exhaustive list. But it's a pretty good summary of, of how our bodies begin to show the toll of that stress. And I, I, I have it with you because I, I do want you just to take a few moments and just look at this and think, how's my body doing? What is it telling me about the current stress load that we've been in? So I want to let you know that um, for our poll, um, the overall impact that the pandemic has had on our personal and professional wellness. Sadly and not surprisingly, 71% of us state that it has suffered. And I would imagine that that's due to some of the things that, um, that I've just summarized. And if, if in, in chat, knowing that the live participants can see your chat, but it's not recorded, um, on the webinar, if you want to add anything, um, to share anything about uh, if it has suffered and why, um, you can certainly share that. Uh, for the 22% who've been able to say it's improved, hallelujah. And <laughs> I'm really grateful that that is your reality. And it just sort of lifts my spirits and inspires me that that could be true. And 11% have said it has stayed the same. Um, which I would say is a, is a tremendous gain as well to be able to say that it has stayed the same in this, in this time. Um, so I'm going to let you see um, those results um, so that uh, it's in your eye view as well. Um, fantastic. Yeah. Okay. I hope that's had enough time for you to look at the poll results. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop the share now. And, um, and we're going to move on to individual risk factors. So what makes me vulnerable to any of these things, secondary traumatic stress, vicarious trauma, compassion fatigue, burnout, well, the research shows that gender, and um, unfortunately for us, given that we're a female-dominated field, it is women who are more vulnerable um, to the impacts. Um, lots of theorizing behind that, by the way, uh, why that's so, and no uh, conclusive answer. Um, a personal history of victimization and trauma, um, and Certainly, yes, the research shows that that's true. How we have supported ourselves and the amounts of uh, support that we've received around that history is, is a very, um, is a resiliency factor. So we have a risk factor of if we have our personal history of victimization and trauma, and then we have a resiliency factor if we've been well supported in that and have had a, a, a chance to process and resolve that. So it's, it's both. Uh, time and field. And what's interesting about that is that the folks who are newer in, um, in the field are at greater risk of experiencing some of these impacts. And the reason for that is just sort of the, 
the onslaught of the exposure as, at first and how our um, worldviews and some of our uh, belief systems get challenged through that initial um, exposure. And there's a fair amount of re-examining that happens when you're new in a field and you may not have the um, depth of, of coping strategies for that but also many years in the field. That it, that's also a vulnerability, a risk factor because of the cumulative exposure um, to not only um, survivor's trauma, but also the cumulative exposure to the myriad of ways that our systems um, do not support us and survivors. Um, coping strategies, whether we have uh, adequate coping strategies, coping strategies that we're utilizing within the workplace, I want to emphasize that, and whether our coping strategies tend to fall in the healthy zone, um, i.e. exercise, debriefing, mindfulness would be healthy zone, versus not so healthy, uh, binge watching Netflix, drinking, numbing, and other ways. Um, not having recognition of vicarious trauma symptoms, not having that information, which is why we're here today, is try to offset that risk factor. Um, protective factors, a greater use of healthy coping mechanisms in our personal time, but also in our work time. Um, I mentioned how longer tenure in the field can be a risk factor in terms of cumulative exposure, but it also gives us time to develop our mojo, so to speak, of our coping mechanisms. Um, and, um, and it comes with an increased sense of competence, a supportive workplace, supportive um, in all ways, um, in terms of doors open, I can come talk to you and debrief in terms of uh, acknowledging vicarious trauma and having embedded strategies within the workplace to mitigate that. Workplace structure, is it a collaborative structure? Is it an open structure? Is it transparent? Are there policies that um, have our wellness embedded in them? And compassion satisfaction, do I like what I do? Do I enjoy my time with survivors? Do I feel that it's meaningful? Those sorts of things. Oh, sorry. It's good if I want, look at my own notes. Um, I would like you just to take a few moments to think about the risk factors and the protective factors that you've just seen. And, um, and so I'm going to move a little bit just back between the two slides so that you can see them. And just to see, hmm, how am I feeling about the balance for me in between both of them? How many in the individual risk factors am I holding? How many of those are relevant to me? And how many of the protective factors do I have for myself? If you'd like to, optional for those who are live, if you would like to share in the chat some of the ways that you are actively supporting yourself in the vulnerabilities. So some of the ways that you're offsetting the vulnerability of having that personal history or being new in the field or being longer tooth in the field or around coping mechanisms. Anything you want to share with each other Again, it won't be recorded. Thank you. And if you're sitting there thinking, yeah, I'm not so happy with that balance, and I really want to be able to increase uh, my healthier coping strategies and maybe have some ideas of what to bring to the workplace, then please tune in to our next two webinars. I think you'll get a fair amount out of those. So I'm going to um, move on to incidence rates. So in a review of the research, 40 to 85% of healthcare professionals were found to be either experiencing compassion fatigue 
or they had high rates of secondary traumatic stress. So that pretty much normalizes it. That's a very high number. And that's not an exposure that is specific to trauma, although they do interact with a lot of traumatized folks. There was a study done nationally in America on clinical social workers. So these are people who are not child protection workers, but um, are doing more of the, the trauma-based work or the mental health work. 15% um, had experienced secondary traumatic stress. Other studies have shown that 38% of social workers now in these studies, this is now starting to include child protection social workers. And we see the numbers coming up because now we're getting closer to exposure to specific trauma, that they have moderate to high levels of secondary traumatic stress. More work, more info on incidence rates. 23 to 27% of mental health professionals experience secondary traumatic stress. Looking solely at child protection service workers, so definitely very trauma specific, 34% of American uh, child protection workers experience secondary traumatic stress. What we know is that the more specific that you get, the closer you get to direct exposure to trauma survivors, the, no, the percentages of uh, experiencing vicarious trauma, secondary traumatic stress increase. Interestingly, there was a study of lawyers who specialize in domestic violence cases, and they had significantly higher levels of secondary traumatic stress and burnout compared to other mental health professionals. So that shows us again, that sort of the closer you get to that specific um, experience, the more impactful it is. And I would say that it's more impactful because of the intensity of the trauma but also about how not well our society is in validating and protecting those who are impacted by interpersonal violence. Now this, I wanna say, and you, you'll note, and you've been through three slides now that nowhere did it say this percentage for anti-violence workers. And unfortunately, the reason for that is that we tend not to rate for quantitative research projects. There's a fair amount of qualitative studies where people have gone to uh, an anti-violence agency or a transition house and done a research study. But in terms of when we get into those big numbers, uh, that hasn't happened. And it's just like the dollars, the research dollars tend not to come <laughs> towards anti-violence workers, unfortunately. Um, even when uh, a while back, uh, Eva did a literature review and even for, for the research that has happened, 94% of the researchers' research was based on first responders, our police, our fire personnel, paramedics, and only 6% was based on community-based anti-violence. Disappointing, not surprising. Another example of the shift that we need to see in our, in our society. Um, this slide, that um, the piece that I haven't spoken to yet, is that 59% of mental health professionals are willing to seek help for themselves when they're experiencing one of these things, vicarious trauma, secondary trauma, compassion fatigue, compared to 15% of law enforcement personnel, personnel. And we certainly know that the police have been doing a fair amount of work of trying to normalize exposure to post-traumatic stress and increase that number. But I'd like to hear from you in chat, those who are with me live, of what are your thoughts about 59% of those who are experiencing a significant impact, who are in the mental health profession, are actually willing to seek help? How do you make sense of that? What are your thoughts about that it's just 59%? I'd like to hear from you um, in the chat.
Now, as I wait for you to um, comment about that, and I will read out what you've um, commented on. I want to say I've been doing clinical supervision um, to a variety of folks, fair amount of folks in the anti-violence field, but also some other fields. I find that um, I provide tools often about how to mitigate this, the impacts on us. And I find that my people don't utilize the tools until things are really acute. Yeah, so we've got someone saying, I don't understand why well, that number would be so low. And then, and others are like, yeah, it seems really low. And yet someone said, and I really appreciate this, some will think their issues aren't big enough to warrant seeking help and put big in quotation marks. Absolutely. Particularly, I think those of us who are in these roles of serving others, we are so used to caretaking that it doesn't dawn on us until it gets acute to begin taking care of ourselves. I suppose mental health professionals think they can apply all their knowledge to themselves without needing as much outside support. True. Would like to have more coverage, financial resources to seek professional help. Absolutely, there's a systems issue here too. And I would say particularly for anti-violence workers as we tend to be in the lower um, pay scale than say a mental health worker. And we may or may not have access to benefits that give us access to those sorts of formalized supports. Uh -huh. And now there's a comment, see this is all so fabulous. I feel like we're expected just to speak up when we're not doing well, but we're also expected to sort of keep it to ourselves. So, so a comment on the culture that we work in and how, you know, is it encouraged to name and acknowledge that we are being impacted? Awareness is a first step. I need to be aware if I know to, to seek help. Yeah. If you take one thing from today, I would ask you to prioritize listening to yourself and not waiting till it's acute to begin actively caring for yourself within your work day, okay, within your work day. And if you're like sitting there thinking, I think I do that, or I think I need more help with that, then please find some time to come to our uh, second webinar and get some more strategies for doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I'm not going to continue reflecting on the chat. I really appreciate what's come so far, um, I'm going to carry on. So I do wanna dive in a little bit deeper into each of the concepts, still with you know an understanding that they're often used interchangeably, but as a woman who's been in the field for 31 years, I'm aware that they have shown up differently within me. So compassion fatigue, um, the graphic uh, speaks volumes of what it feels like to be experiencing compassion fatigue. It is profound and it is gradual. It, it, it's something that sort of creeps in to our being, into our life. It is an emotional and sometimes physical exhaustion that we develop over the course of our careers. Here's a good quote from the man who first coined that term. There's a cost to caring. Professionals who listen to clients' stories of fear, pain, and suffering may feel similar fear, pain, and suffering because they care. Again, not because something's wrong with you, because they care. Sometimes we feel we are losing our own sense of self to the clients we serve. Those words really resonated to me. And if that resonates to you, then yes, it's time to really start showing up to what does my heart need? What do my boundaries need in order to reclaim a greater sense of self? More words on compassion fatigue. 
an erosion of all the things that keep us connected to others in our caregiver role. Our empathy, our hope, our ability to tolerate strong emotions or difficult stories in others, and of course, our compassion, not only for ourselves, for others, sorry, for others, but also for ourselves. And I believe also for our colleagues. And so I, I hear that sometimes from the folks that I support, the other anti-violence workers out there, that they'll say that their, their awareness that they really needed to begin attending to themselves more was really about how cranky, whether they experienced expressed it out loud or not, how judgmental they began to feel towards their colleagues, towards themselves, towards their loved ones. Um, sometimes felt cranky towards the clients when that really wasn't representative of their values or how they actually typically feel in the world. That's an indication that you might be experiencing um, compassion fatigue. Um, the, what the research has shown us on compassion fatigue, if we ignore these senses, these impacts as have been listed in this slide, and that there's a lack of a continued lack of attendance to our own emotional needs, then compassion fatigue tends to escalate over time. It just worsens. Ignoring and avoiding is not the answer. And I'm really aware of, uh, you know, we started pretty early in our presentation today, uh, acknowledging the impact of the pandemic, acknowledging chronic stress, the, the stress of multiple roles. And some of you are going, I just don't have space to do that emotional attendance to myself. And the good news is stay tuned for a second webinar. I promise you, I'm going to show you so many strategies that literally take Two minutes, three minutes, okay? So you don't have to revamp your entire life. However, if there's room to, sometimes that's a really good answer as well. So I'm gonna move on to secondary trauma. Secondary trauma is having a reaction that involves others' traumatic injury, trauma stories, often accompanied by panic or strong fear, horror, sense of helplessness. And absolutely, that's what it was for me. At first I thought, what is happening to me? <laughs> I, you know, to have, to literally have intrusive symptoms about someone else's experiences was quite bewildering for me at first. And it was scary um, and anxiety provoking. And so, um, and sometimes it can come with sleep disturbance. Sometimes the intrusive imagery is in our dreams. And so we do need to pay attention to that because it, oftentimes it's what we're processing in our dreams. Our brains do that as a, they're trying to help us. They're trying to, it's trying to process the, the stressful stuff that's happened in our lives. And if we're finding that's getting louder and more acute and more disturbing, that could be an indication that some of the secondary trauma stress is, is beginning to happen and that you would want to pay attention to that. Um, again, we'll, in the second uh, webinar, we'll go over some of the tools for that. But oftentimes the strategies that you provide survivors of how they reprocess, contain, ground, their experiences of traumatic symptoms, that's what needs to be applied to us if we're experiencing secondary traumatic stress. Burnout. Burnout is real. Burnout is profound. I think we've had burnout as a term. Well, I know we've had burnout as a term around for so much longer than these other terms. We've had burnout as a, an official term since the 70s. And perhaps because it's been around for so long, people tend to refer to burnout, burnout in kind of a offhand, disdainful way. And I would like us to stop that <laughs> because it's very real. 
Um, it's a physical, emotional exhaustion as a re result of prolonged stress and frustration. It is not trauma specific. This is where my workload keeps increasing and increasing and I don't have the resources to deal with it. It can often be the toll of the wait list. It can be that um, more and more outcomes are asked of me, but my hours aren't increasing. It can be the burnout that comes from repetitive turnover in my agency. And I have repeating responsibilities of onboarding, retraining, mentoring someone in addition to continuing my um, client load, responding to my client load. Um, it's a sense of powerlessness to achieve my work goals. What it, how it shows up differently than vicarious trauma is that it alters our view of our workplace. We often become jaded, disconnected, bitter about our workplace, not about our worldview. Um, so that's how it differs. So people can absolutely be experiencing vicarious trauma, which is a more trauma-specific impact, and be experiencing burnout. So it can be an either or, it can be an and. And then we come to this term, vicarious trauma. It was a McCann and Perlman, our feminist foremothers, who first uh, did research in feminist organizations and um, arrived at this understanding. It is a transformation or change in a helper's inner experience as a result of responsibility for and engagement, empathetic engagement, with traumatized clients and their stories. So it's that twofold thing. I feel res responsible to show up to this individual, to help them connect to resources, to mitigate their suffering. And I am feeling alongside them. My heart is engaged with them. And it's this twofold thing that can result in vicarious trauma. Some of the specific risk factors for vicarious trauma is the intensity of our clients' realities. Those of you whose work brings you in close and in um, longer contact with highly marginalized people, people who are dispossessed, people who are in crisis often because they don't have enough of uh, the supports and foundation around them to emerge out of that crisis, who often are complex trauma survivors as well, that intensity um, makes us more vulnerable to vicarious trauma. Having ongoing, difficult, conflictual, intense, clasped client staff interaction. If many of your interactions in a day feel conflictual, intense, difficult, that is a risk factor. If some of if there are ongoing aspects of your job duties that are overwhelming or dissatisfying, and when I say that what immediately pops up in my mind is for those workers, the outreach workers, the community-based victim assistance workers, the sexual assault workers, who are accompanying survivors in court. Incredibly important role. Often overwhelming and dissatisfying because now you are witnessing our systems acting in ways that are not trauma-informed. And the things that you can do in those moments is very limited, is truncated because there are rules and procedures in court environments. So that's a risk factor for vicarious trauma. A perceived lack of workplace support. And I think it's important to look at that language. If you feel unsupported in your workplace, that's a risk factor. 
your manager may feel that you're well supported or that we have lots of supports for our people. But do the people on the ground feel well supported? And our research shows that that's a risk factor. And as I've mentioned, if you're a newer worker, you do have limited experience. You're on that uncomfortable side of a learning curve. <laughs> we all remember being on that side. It's not fun. <laughs> and, um, but you've got high exposure. So limited experience, some questioning of my competence, <laughs> the uncomfortableness of that side of the learning curve, high exposure, plus potentially less developed coping strategies. That's a risk factor for vicarious trauma. I love this overall comment. The most insidious, wormy <laughs> thing that creeps in that we're not aware of, impact of vicarious traumatization is its assault on our hope and idealism. So true. Those of us who are perhaps longer in the tooth in this field can probably really relate to that. And so I want to speak to those of us who are in longer in the tooth in this field. If you resonate with this and you're aware that, yes, I've, I certainly have lost some of my idealism, I have lost some of my hope, please do not pass on that baton to your newer workers. We need their hope and idealism. We need their freshness. If you have caught yourself saying, uh, you'll learn, or, yeah, I'll see if you're saying that in nine months. If you've caught yourself saying that, I'm asking you to stop, please. We so need that fresh look. It's a gift to all of us. Again, I'm looking at overall impacts of vicarious trauma. And we're going to look at sort of the yin and the yang here. It can show up as avoidance in ourselves, um, kind of a, a numbing um, presentation, wanting to avoid particular a particular client or particular type of client presentation, wanting to avoid certain difficult topics or a particular presentation of trauma. But the avoidance can also be within ourselves, that we're becoming more disconnected within ourselves. That may be uh, overall that we feel more disconnected within ourselves or um, just connected when we are with um, a, a particular client or a certain uh, client presentation. Uh, it may show as that we feel numb when a particular topic is raised. So... It can show up as avoidance or it can show up, here's the other side, persistently in a roused state. If I'm the type of person who's now moving through my workplace at a fast pace and small things are bringing large reactions to me, that stress is my norm, here's a lens. This might be vicarious, how vicarious trauma is now communicating itself in you. If you know that it's become normal that you're snippy with your kids or your pets, um, this may be vicarious trauma presenting. Okay. Now, again, some of us are pretty good at containing. So <laughs> I may feel like this woman who's pulling her hair out, but I may not be showing it. <laughs> um, but if I feel that way inside, that's that persistent um, arousal state within me, and it still needs um, our attention. That's your indicator. Other ways that it shows up in my in my body, I might have my a heightened startle reflex. I'm jump here. Or I jump higher when someone comes around the corner or opens my office door. I may have difficulty sleeping because of this arousal state. I may be repeatedly, repeatedly dreaming about my work. I may have a loss of sexual desire or libido um, because of when our, when our stress level is consistently up here, that dampens those natural 
flows, I'll call it. Um, emotional. Um, joy just being diminished, whether I'm having fewer experiences of joy or I'm aware that how it often can present is maybe paddle boarding is just my thing. And I'm paddle boarding and I realize it's just not really doing it for me. I'm not getting the same kind of bliss that I usually do. Free floating anger or irritation. Generalized worry, especially over clients. Maybe I've moved into worry wart mode, or maybe I bring that into my personal life and I become the hoverer or worrier over my beloveds. Am I beginning to have difficulty talking about my feelings? Um, am I experiencing a loss of confidence in myself? Now you'll notice as I'm going through these slides that many of these indicators are very much the same as how direct trauma shows up in us. Now, behaviorally, it's very interesting how we respond in our actions to vicarious trauma. I might overwork. And then at first you might think, well, that's counterintuitive. Work is the thing that's... <laughs> really impacting me. You would think I wouldn't do that. But it does make sense. If I'm in a persistent arousal state, and I'm like, running, it often leads me to overwork. Also, vicarious trauma may have been informed by working in an organizational culture that's really promoting overwork, self-sacrifice, kind of the the hero who's always available and that can also lead us to overwork we might be dropping out of community activities that we used to do obviously this is not pandemic um, informed um, we may be rejecting physical or emotional closeness we may be repeatedly late um, which is now actually you know to look at that it could be that it's very challenging to uh, get balance around our multiple roles Absolutely. If I'm having to get kids to here and there and there and then show up to work, well, repeated tardiness could be solely about my multiple roles. But it could be about the avoidance and numbing that's starting to happen around work and increased absences from work. Interpersonally, am I isolating myself from colleagues? Am I kind of turtling in a professional way? Am I blaming others? Am I impatient with my colleagues, with clients, whether I express it or not, personally? Am I engaged in increased conflict? And that may be in the workplace. And it often is expressed at home. Um, am I beginning to work in silos? It, kind of, it comes from isolation of colleagues. It's just sort of turning away from our various community partners, writing them off and, and working more as the, I'm the only one who gets this. Um, yeah. As we said, vicarious trauma begins to impact how we see our world, how we see ourselves. It impacts our meaning making or our belief systems. We might start seeing, believing that the world overall is dangerous. We might start thinking people aren't to be trusted. We might be disillusioned in all systems. Like literally even, oh, it's time for me to phone tell us about my cell plan. And my thought bubble is, yeah, this isn't going to go well. My needs aren't going to be met. Like that's when we just sort of approach everything with that kind of um, orientation. An overall sense of personal helplessness. What can I do? Um, or I'm the only one who gets it. If, if any of these resonate, we need to pay attention to that. And we need to actively... <laughs> work at cognitive reframes and exposures to experiences, to others that help balance out that. So an example that um, 
I'm often willing to share is a time in my career where the bulk of the work that I was doing was in uh, sexual abuse, sexual assault, and and uh, specifically childhood sexual abuse, sexual assault. And I noticed that I, when I saw men interacting um, one-on-one with their children or with children, you know, whether they're children or not, I was hypervigilant. I was monitoring whether he was safe. What is he doing? Is it okay? I was coming from a danger perspective. And I'm so grateful that I noticed that and challenged myself on that. Um, and realized, oh, this is, this is a result of my work. And so I consciously set up with uh, my friends who were parenting, I wasn't parenting at the time, that I had regular routine scheduled times, one-on-one times with their healthy, intact, safe children. And lo and behold, over a, a period of months, that changed. Next time I saw a man interacting with children out in the playground, I would stop and just enjoy and feel resourced and refreshed to see that to see that so that's an example of catching it challenging myself and um, seeking different exposures to balance that out in job performance vicarious trauma shows up as making more and more errors um, decreased quality of work um, difficulty retaining information um, things are just falling out <laughs> more and more. Avoidance of specific job responsibilities or getting over involved in details or perfectionism. That actually can be an avoidance um, technique. If I focus on the small stuff, I don't have to deal with the big things that just feel too impactful. So, this is um, uh, a quotation from another anti violence worker. There's something else that I notice related to my worldview and my beliefs. My alertness to danger. Careful when you are driving, you might get in an accident. Careful of that person. Just all of these bad things could happen anytime. I am very, very hypervigilant to danger that isn't even there. So in summary, around the impacts, irregardless of what label you're going to use, if you're having a confusion right now because we've just sped through a fair amount of information about if it's compassion fatigue or secondary trauma, let's just drop the labels for now. How does this show up? It changes my beliefs. It changes my expectations of myself and others. It leads to changes in my assumptions of myself in the world. It can show up in whether I allow myself to depend on others, whether I am able to trust systems, resources, or others. My sense of safety, my sense of my family's safety, my sense of my own inherent power and ability to affect change in my life, in the world, my independence. Am I able to have a healthy flow from independence versus interdependence versus dependence? Am I able to move through all of those states? My esteem, just how am I feeling about myself? Do I feel good about myself? Do I feel good about my contributions? And intimacy, uh, am I allowing my, my people close to me? Am I allowing people to truly know me? Am I allowing them to know how I'm doing in this work? Am I allowing physical closeness? So I'm imagining, and I, I haven't been able to be as as cued into your chat as I would like to have been, but I really appreciate the, the sharing that is going on there. At this point, maybe in this moment, you might have a certain heavy feeling as you're like, ooh, I'm noticing this and this and this, and that's me and that's me and that's me over there. And although that can be a painful knowing, 
it's a really good night. Awareness is, going, is a really, really first step. And then that willingness to show up to ourselves and say, okay, dang it, what am I going to do? Um, but I want to also focus on, um, oh, you know what? I did. I'm sorry. I'm going to go back in a moment. Please excuse me. Or don't. But um, I want to, we'll just go here. What I would like you to do, if you're willing to, if we could have um, a um, nice looking board come up that would have give you an opportunity to just reflect right now on things that you'd be willing to share, and it would be recorded, but it's all anonymous, of the, th the things that you do right now to support yourselves and to see if um, some other things can happen. So thanks for your patience. Um, hopefully we'll get to be funky fairly soon. Um, so I'm going to um, talk about vicarious post-traumatic growth. And um, this was um, first coined back in 2004 and it was, it, it came up actually in, in relationship to people who had experienced a trauma and the type of growth that happened for them once they'd had an opportunity to process the trauma, the growth that happened for them once they'd been able to process the trauma, um, a positive psychological change in the wake of struggling with highly challenging life circumstances. But what's interesting is that um, after it was first identified in 2004, it, be, it became um, applicable to those of us who provide um, response to people who are working through their trauma. And so I'm just going to play this video of uh, Sonia lyon um, who is just going to talk to us about what is post-traumatic growth. Can a client emerge from a tragedy at a higher level of happiness than they experienced before? Dr. Sonia Lubomirsky, a psychology professor and researcher, has studied this phenomenon known as post-traumatic growth. Sonia reveals why this happens, but not only that, she shares new perspectives on how to foster it. So imagine that someone had a bad event, like whether it's a diagnosis or losing a job, losing a spouse. And for some people, they kind of, they're like this in happiness, they go down and they never recover. And that's actually a pretty small subset. Other people, they go down in their happiness and then they go back up to the same level. And that's the majority. Um, and so a lot of resilience research is on that. You kind of, and that's literally what resilience is. You bounce back. So you bounce to the same level you were before. But what I think is the most fascinating are people who are kind of going down, and then when they come back up, they actually come to a higher level than they were before. And that's called post-traumatic growth. Not to say that we should all experience trauma so we could experience that, um, but if you have experienced it, some people just are able to, they grow, they appreciate their life more, they feel like life is so precious. I didn't know, you know, I didn't really appreciate that before. They kind of live day to day. But, you know, and what's interesting to me is, are the individual differences, you know, what, what, what makes that person special that see it that way? And actually, my very, very, at the beginning, when I first started doing research on happiness, back when I was in grad school, my advisor back then, and I, he, he had this friend, uh, talked about this, he had a friend who was a Holocaust survivor. Well, actually, two different people he knew who were Holocaust survivors. And he said, one of them said, you know, it's indecent or obscene to ever be happy again after the Holocaust. Like after that happened, how can anyone be happy again? And the other person said, it's insane or indecent to never, to, to be unhappy again. Like how can you not enjoy life, regular life, you know, after you've survived the concentration camp? So it's just to kind of puts into this stark contrast, this very different perspective that some people have. Fortunately, most people have the more positive perspective. Uh, and they grow. And so anyway, that, that's what's most interesting to me about resilience. Um, there's also some research that shows sort of how people can become more resilient. Laura King, who's at Missouri, she does research on meaning. And so she finds, for example, that, you know, some people make this distinction between happiness and meaning. Like, you know, you could be happy or you could have meaning. 
And, and I've always thought that they really go together. You know, it feels good when you feel like you have meaning in your life. And so that's exactly what she finds. She actually did this really great study where she measured people throughout the day. And she asked people, how happy do you feel? And how much meaning do you feel right now? And on days that you felt happier, you, you felt you had more meaning. And on days you had more meaning, you felt happier. So they kind of cause each other. Um, and lots of other. She also studies coping. And um, she finds, for example, getting back to coping, that when people experience negative events uh, or like real major adversity, they uh, not only, they, they actually can become happier, they become more mature. And so she, for example, has studied uh, women who have kids with Down syndrome. And sort of she studied uh, their life stories and how, how they describe, you know, when they first found out. And, and basically she finds that most of them have become kind of more mature through that experience, more kind of cognitively complex. It's like they think about life in a more com complex way. Um, she also looked at, so these are, so she looked at different groups, women who got divorced after many, many years. So older women who are divorced after like very long marriages, suddenly their identity has changed and how they've coped with that. And they also, she also studied uh, gays and lesbians who've come out um, and how, you know, the hard parts of that. Um, so anyway, so she finds that people not only get happier after some of these very difficult events, but they become more mature. What's interesting when we look at, well, how do we do in terms of experiencing some of this good stuff around post-traumatic growth? Um, there was a survey of, of therapists who work with trauma survivors and 86% of them reported that they felt that they did have post-traumatic growth, um, that they had gained in sensitivity, compassion, insight, tolerance, and empathy. Judith Herman, who is our feminist therapist for mother, identified that the care that we provide for survivors enables us to have a deeper appreciation of our lives, deepen our understanding of ourselves and others, and develop new relationships and deepen existing ones. And I would imagine that most of us can also relate to that. Um, if we, we can also be active in enhancing the post-traumatic growth that we experience um, by embracing new opportunities, uh, both in the personal and professional fronts. Um, if you know that uh, the direct service of survivor work is um, molding you in ways that you're not happy with, you know, that would be the time to engage in conversations about, is there some prevention work that I can do? Is there some other um, expressions that I can take on in the workplace? Can I get more involved in, in, in our workplace wellness initiatives and, and lead on that? Um, you know, to put more effort into our personal relationships and increase the pleasure that we derive from being around people that we love. Um, I think that many of us in, a, in the pandemic had to get really creative around that because we're having so much time with very few people that we've had to really get uh, thoughtful and intentional about how to actually increase our enjoyment in that. Uh, a heightened sense of gratitude towards life altogether. And you know whether that's just continuing to speak my gratitudes each day of what is what is there for me in my life, a greater spiritual connection so that we're not feeling so uh, alone in holding things up, an increased emotional strength. Um, I think in the presence of time, we'll just stay with this question and um, we won't go any further. Um, thank you so much for survivors remind me to be grounded in reality and to appreciate being true to myself, feeling calm and doing the work I was really meant to do is not just a job. I have learned a tremendous amount from my clients. It has brought awareness of the probable meaning behind my family's behaviors and has brought understanding and healing between all of us, heightened awareness of my needs for self-care and looking after myself better. Thank you so much. I know that I perhaps have not read out all of the stickies but in, in really small areas, there's just such depth and wisdom here. It's, it's really fabulous to um, things that one can specifically do to seed post-traumatic growth 
more is to engage deeply in all aspects of your life, work, spiritual life, personal life, every aspect. Expand your resources, both in the workplace, outside of the workplace, and examine your beliefs. We do need more than self-care. We need strategies that both protect and replenish us within the workplace. Isolation within our work may lead us to shouldering a responsibility that's more than our part. It is not all up to us. And I'll just ask you to think about um, only one part of a larger whole. Maybe that would be a, a picture from an uh, annual training forum that you um, attended. Maybe it's a, uh, a picture of your extended family. Maybe it's a, um, a calling on spiritual being, beings to be with you. Uh, whatever it is, uh, I love this quotation. It occurs to me that there's so much that we don't have to do. We don't have to make the sun shine. That's what the sun does. We don't have to make the birds sing. That's what they do. It's not all up to us. And yet, when we notice, when we pay attention, our participation makes a difference. Some mysterious alchemy happens when we bring our careful attention to what is. It's not all up to us, but our participation makes a difference. We strengthen our well-being by appreciating and incorporating what we learn from our clients' healing processes. And that was certainly captured on the um, stickies that you wrote on. The other things that help seed resilience, having secure attachments in our life, having supportive relationships, the nature of our relationship with our clients, altruism, self-care optimism, extroversion. Now, as an introvert, I have a wee bit of an issue with that. But what I understand that to mean is that I do need to find ways to talk about how I am, how I'm doing in my work, what, what that work is showing up in me. In me. Um, to have an internal locus of control, to really focus on what I can influence instead of always allowing my focus to go to what I can't influence. Emotional control, I prefer the language emotional regulation, emotional awareness, self-compassion, and task-oriented coping skills. Take, getting down to it, taking care of myself. So that is the end of the prepared um, webinar including all of my glitches thank you so much for being with us thank you for those who are uh, seeing this from the the comfort of your home and your office at a later time thank you for gathering with us virtually a shout out to my friend larry taylor who provided most of the photography for this webinar um, and again a reminder there is an evaluation tool a survey monkey that we would absolutely like you to um, participate in it's very short it won't take up much time may see some of you tomorrow um, may see you at another time